If anybody take a take a stab in the dark at what they feel like all of that scriptures on that list might have in common? This is the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Go out on the land. Yeah. Thankfulness. Yeah. One of the things that God dropped in my heart and dropped in my spirit that I wanted to begin to share with us is the idea that, you know, there are so many times we, we see people, and even maybe we sometimes might be guilty of this in certain, in certain times. Almost anybody can appear to be thankful when it's appropriate to be so. Right. You know, we see it all. We see it all the time. Um, you know, on TV. If you ever watched any of the award shows, yeah. You know what I mean? They've, you know, and and I, I got to tell you, some of the folks that that receive those awards, you know, like the Oscars and the Grammys and the Country Music Awards, and you know, that, on and on and on. You know, I don't know about you, but I have never in my life met so many humble people in all of my born days. When you listen to their speech, <laughs> you understand where I'm going. But sadly enough, we know in some of those situations, it's nothing more than a speech. What what they're saying is only lit deep. That wasn't in my notes. Somebody better write that one down. That's, that's a good one. That was a good one, wasn't it, Josh? Sometimes what what we say is only lit deep. But I gotta, I gotta tell you, and this is what I want to bring out to us today. God encourages us in His Word to make sure that our thankfulness is more than just lip deep. And and sometimes, you know, we we get in this thing, and and you know, and, and even after 41 years, God love her, most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. Speaking of my wife. Somebody better be taking notes. But it's on video, so I did say it. Was that just lip? But, no, that, no, that was more than lip deep. You were paying attention. But even after 41 years of being together, I have to admit to you that we're still working it out. You see, because... Anybody remember some of the things, you know, you, you don't hear as much about it anymore, but, you, you know, there's, there's an old adage that uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Um, there was actually a Bible study um, that uh, was going around here uh, a few years ago, several years ago. Um, they had another little cliche that they like to say. They, I believe in that particular Bible study, um, it was men are waffles, women are spaghetti. Yep. Bingo. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. For those of you that had that Bible study, you'll understand what that means. Uh, for those of you that don't, look it up. <laughs> All they're really trying to say is, you know, in our brains, okay, and Bonnie and I have this conversation all the time, in, in, in our two different brains, our two different brains work differently. And as of late, you know, due to my condition, Bonnie has been just so gracious. And many a times I'll be sitting in my chair and she'll, you know, she'll bring me something to eat. She'll bring me my coffee, much like Stephen does here on, on Sunday morning. You know, when I come in on Sunday morning, Stephen has a cup of coffee prepared. God love him. Uh, I appreciate that so much. Um, but what happens is sometimes what comes out of my mouth gets misconstrued. Because Bonnie will bring me something, and uh, you know maybe I'll make some simple comment. Because she'll want to know, did you like that? Was that, you know? And um, I'll make some kind of a little comment, whatever it is, you know. And she perceives it as, well, if you don't like it, I'll just go get you something else. It's like <laughs> that's not what I said. I didn't say I didn't like it, you know, but. She didn't hear what she was expecting to hear because I didn't say what she was expecting me to say. But at the same time, I didn't say what she heard. Right. Did I get it right? 
So we have to understand sometimes, you know, words are good. And, and she's taught me this. You know, we've, we've, and we even do this in some of the wedding ceremonies, you know, about the little things. And, 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 and if I've never told you this before, I'm telling you now. Okay? You might want to write this down. Because this is advice from your pastors. If you have a spouse, you should never go through one single solitary day without, at some point throughout that day, telling that spouse, I love you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just good advice. You take yeah. that for what it's worth. But that's just good advice. <clears throat> if you have a spouse, you should tell that spouse every single day you are together that you love them. I'd actually give you the same advice about your children. The sad part about it is I think there are a lot of children in the world who don't know what a hug feels like. There's children in the world who don't know what it is to have somebody wrap their arms around them, you know, in a completely innocent way yep. and let those children know they are loved. As human beings, we all need that. I said, okay, Pastor, get to the point. I'm, I'm getting there. Give me a minute. I'm on one of my little bunny trails. But you understand, and it's important that we verbalize that. But what's even more important than that is that somewhere along the line, we've got to let that get beyond lip deep. You understand what I'm saying? You know, because I've heard people say those words to me. Now, they say it in a little bit different context than she does. But I've heard people, and I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers. I, I, I would be safe probably in saying that this doesn't apply to anybody who's sitting in this room. But I've heard, you know, had people, you know, embrace me or whatever. Hey, love you, man. And I don't know, well, they don't mean that. You know, they're doing it. They're saying it because it's appropriate just to say that. And to mean that. But I can tell by their actions. I can tell by the way they do things at certain times and how they really are. You know, and in the same way we just had a, we had a situation here not too long ago where somebody had made a comment uh, in a particular situation. They 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 wanted to they wanted to be here in a, in a particular situation because there was a past situation that they weren't. And it just tears them up that they weren't here, you know, in that situation. So now a situation has reoccurred, and oh man, they 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 got to be here because they feel so bad about not being here the last time. Those were the words that came out of their mouth. Can I tell you from my observation, they're here, but they ain't here. I understand. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> That's a yeah. Yeah, and, and what I'm trying to get at is I'm just trying to drive home what I'm trying to say in the title for this sermon thankfulness is a way of life you understand when we live in a state of being thankful it goes far beyond the words that come out of our mouth you know what I mean? I mean, I know, I can, I can guarantee you, I, I can absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt guarantee you there are people this year that sat at their Thanksgiving table and, and had their little deal at Thanksgiving and say, oh, I thank God for my family. And yet they've got family they haven't spoken to in 20 years, mm -hmm. which is why all their family isn't around their table. Because they don't speak to each other. Mercy. Lord help us. I, I hope I'm impacting you. I don't, I don't know if that applies to anybody in this room or not. And, and if it does, please fix that. Amen. I'm not going to apologize for it because it's the truth. Amen. And if it and if it's bothering you and if it fits you, I'm not sorry, but I'm just going to tell you you need to fix that. Yes. But when we get to the point, when we begin to study these scriptures and we begin to look at, you know, this whole deal, 
what we have to learn to do is we, we have to learn that, you know, it's more than just something that comes out of our mouth. If it's not a state of mind, if it's not a way of life for us to be thankful, you know, for everything. Can, can I share just one of the scriptures here? Let me see where it is. I believe it's Philippians chapter 4. Can anybody besides me quote that? Philippians 4 and 4? I'll get you started. Philippians 4 and 4 says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. thanksgiving, make your request known. You understand what that verse is trying to say? Because it's telling you to be anxious for nothing, you know, but through prayer and supplication, bring your problems, bring all that's wrong in your life, make your requests. So it means if you're, if you're, if you're leaning on this verse... If you're, you know, you're in there saying, okay, Lord, the Bible says be anxious for nothing, so I'm not going to... Obviously, something in your life has gone wrong. Thanks, Dave. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I'm there, brother. <laughs> but even when you're in the middle of that, he says, bring it to God. But what does he do? He puts on there and says, with thanksgiving. Giving. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I say it a different way? In everything... Give thanks. I gotta, I gotta tell you, and I'm not sure if I shared this with you, you know, here. I know I shared it with a few people. Uh, I shared it with a few people. I'm not sure whether I shared it here, um, you know, but a little over a week ago. I'm not sure what day of the week it was now. The last couple weeks have been pretty hectic. But um, we had a little situation, you know, Bonnie's mom, um, you know, they'd been checking on her. She hadn't been feeling well. And, you know, of course, they kind of keep an eye on her as well as they can. She lives alone, 86 years old. She's been without uh, Bonnie's dad now for a, for a little over a year. Uh, but they kind of keep an eye on her. Most of the time, it's routine. But whatever day of the week it was, Bonnie got a call. We had just been there. I guess this was a week ago Thursday. A week ago last Thursday. Because we had just been there Wednesday evening. Bonnie and I had stopped in. Everything was fine. Her sister stopped in after we did. You know, everything was fine. We all went home, you know, and all was right with the world. Bonnie got a call early morning. She was getting ready to come in here to help pack boxes for food pantry. She gets a call early in the morning. It was Kim. Hey, I've been trying to call mom all morning. You know, she's not picking up the phone. Can you stop and check on her? Of course, we all think, you know, we've been down that road, right? We've all been down that road. Oh, well, and Bonnie, the words even came out of her mouth. You know, well, Kim called, I need to stop down, you know, check on mom. She couldn't get her on the phone. But she probably just in the shower or in the bathroom or whatever, you know, but I, I'm going to stop down and check on her. Where she got there, found her in bed, completely unresponsive, you know, showing all the classic signs and symptoms of a stroke. So, of course, got the ambulance, rushed her to the hospital, you know, and, and of course, thankfully, we found out later she did not have a stroke. She did have some other issues, and these particular issues just, I mean, 20 years in EMS, I know what a stroke looks like. Right. But when I tell you she had all the classic signs and symptoms of a stroke, she had them, all of them. And I, I would have, you know, laid all the money in the world if that's what was going on. As it turned out, it wasn't. That's a God thing. Amen. I don't know how else Amen. to explain it. It's a God right. thing. Right. So that being said, that was on a Thursday. Um, that day, you know, as Bonnie was at the hospital, you know, they were doing their deal. I was kind of at home in my chair, just, you know, standing by. Um, and, and during my time there, all of a sudden, my light went on. And, I, and this, is, this is clear as anything. I could hear the Spirit of the Lord begin to speak to me. And he says, this is why. For some of you, that doesn't make much sense, but let me explain it to you. See, because for those of you who may not know, you know, I'm talking about Thursday, November the 18th. I was originally scheduled to have my back surgery Wednesday, November 17th. And it got postponed. I wasn't happy. And trust me, God knew I wasn't happy. Because I'll be honest with you, I told him I wasn't happy. I'm like, really, God? 
I mean, I've been waiting and you promised, you know, I mean, I know that you've touched me and you've healed me and I'm walking through everything that you've called me to walk through and I'm, I'm doing my little thing and, and you know, you, you got to let them pull the rug. I mean, I, didn't, I wasn't blaming God for doing it, but I was blaming him for letting somebody else do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, you may not be the guy that's, you know, you may not be the guy, you know, when, when you know, how they, somebody would be standing and somebody get on their hands and knees behind somebody and then somebody would give them a push. You know, you may not have been the guy that was on his knees or the guy that gave the push, but you were the third guy standing there just laughing your butt off. <laughs> and I got to tell you, that's the way I felt. Right. Can I just be honest with you? That's just the way I felt. I know God didn't do it, but God was standing right there. And I'm thinking to myself, well, God, are you, are you getting a good laugh out of this? I'm just trying to be transparent with you. God spoke to me on that Thursday because he never did take time to explain it to me then. All I got out of him was, I know what I'm doing. I know you're all sitting there thinking, you know, you know some of you have had that same conversation with God. Go ahead, you might as well admit it or not. I don't care, but you know it's the truth. You had that same conversation with God, and God says, Be still. You know that I'm God. I got this. But that's all I got out of him. God just says, Trust me, I've got this. He, he, he said it to Paul one time. He says, My grace is sufficient. Well, I got news for you. His grace was sufficient, but the answer he gave wasn't. <laughs> Until Thursday, November the 18th, when I'm sitting at home, and my wife is sitting at the hospital praying over her dear mother because we felt sure as anything she just had that stroke. And God spoke to me just as clear as I'm speaking to you, and he said, this is why. Mm -hmm. wow. And I realized then, my, my poor wife... I can't imagine what it would have been like for her to have her husband down in Presby land, you know, after major surgery on Wednesday and then getting the call that her mother had stroked on Thursday. I thought, my goodness, I can't imagine what that would have put her through. I just had to apologize. I had to ask God to forgive me and say, God, why did I ever doubt? If you do something in my life, you have a reason. Yes. Can I tell you? And, and what, am I, what am I saying is, what I'm saying is we got to get out of ourselves. we got to stop being so full of ourselves. Just put our faith and our trust for our very lives in God's hands and live a life and be thankful. Well, I can't be thankful about everything because everything don't make me feel thankful. you got to get over that. you got to get under, you got to get into that place where you live that life of being thankful and you live in that place where you're just living a life of thankfulness and I don't care what's going on. You know, and some of us, we struggle. Sometimes, you know, and, 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 he, and why am I telling you all this? Why I'm telling you all this is because as we've been talking over the last few weeks, remember we talked about how everybody has a place in the body of Christ? You know, we've become, when it comes to church, we've become consumers. We're looking for the church with the best cafe. We're looking for the church with the best worship team. We're looking for the Preach. church with the best kids program. Preach. For this program and for that program. We walk into a church with a consumer mentality and say, well, we'll see what this church has for me. If, if they suit my needs, if they give me what I need, I'll be back. If they don't, see ya. Like I shared last week, I just kind of touched on it. What I had to, you know, share back then is, yes, I believe with all, of, with all of my heart, God gifts the church. Just as he gifts people, he gifts churches to, to fill a certain void in the body of Christ. We're not all heads. We're not all shoulders. We're not all whatever. Some of us have to be feet. Some of us has to be some of those uncomely parts. I'm not saying church, you know, Butler Church is an uncomely part. I think I think Butler Church is one of the most beautiful churches I've ever seen. Why do I say that? Because it's filled with spirit-filled yeah, people. Yeah, right. Amen. Amen. But what I'm saying is, yes, a church is gifted to minister to to people who are lost, bring them in, and give them a certain kind of love and a sense of belonging. Why we have that new byline now? You know, come to a place where you can belong. And if you see that's in great big bold letters and underlined. 
you know, the three words that are supposed to stick out? Come. You belong. Yes. What's that mean? It means anybody and everybody is welcome here. Yes. Yes. Some of you agree with me. But I got news for you. I don't care who works, walks through that door. Amen. We're going to roll out the welcome mat. Amen. And we're going to say, welcome. You, you can belong here. You understand? And, 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 and this comes right down to it now. But see, when we cross over now, we're not speaking about those who are lost anymore. We're not talking about those that are wandering, those who are on their prodigal journeys, and those who are... We're, we're talking about what are supposed to be spirit-filled Christians. Yes. And what are they doing? They're shopping the body of Christ. Lord, help us. I got news for you. We all have a calling. We all have a gifting. Amen. And you know, I know you may go to a, you may go to a local church because I believe every local church needs to have a kids ministry. Every local church needs to have a youth ministry. Right. You know, some do, some don't. We don't really have a youth ministry going right now. We don't have a real active youth ministry at this church because we don't really have a whole lot of active youth. But just because somebody, you know, God's spirit would lead somebody, they walk in this church with their four kids, and they say, well, I'm not going to that church. They don't have a youth ministry. You know, you got to understand something. As a spirit-filled believer, the reason God may have brought you to this church is to help us start one. Amen. It ain't all about you. Sometimes God does lead us to a church who can meet our needs, who can help us, who can encourage us, who can build us up. But I got news for you. There are also times when God will lead you and take you to a particular church because they need help. And he wants you to do it. We got to get out of this consumer mentality and get into a point where, you know, thank you, God. Marcia just shared that with me again in the, in the card. We, we talk fondly, you know, about that day, you know, because I think, Marcia, you, you'd come to this church a long time ago, right? She had come to this church, and then, you know, she had decided to move on, and she was going somewhere else, and, and I believe if I, under, if I remember the story the way you shared it correctly, Marcia, Marcia, you were on your way that morning to church somewhere else, weren't you? Yeah. Wow. And she drove past... And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to her. He says, you know what? Turn around and go back. Thank you, Lord. You need to go back home. And I'm going to tell you right now, the transformation that I've seen God make, you know, and I believe at one point, because I can remember, I can remember, you know, Marcia sharing some things, you know, with me, some things that were going on in her personal life and some some struggles she was having and some things that, you know, were going on. And she says, Pastor, I just need you to pray with me about these things. Hallelujah. And I think if, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, a lot of those things we prayed about when you first come have all been resolved. Absolutely. Praise the Lord. Praise Amen. Absolutely. But see, here's the beauty of it. God brought her here initially to minister to her. But you can't imagine how many times I've told her since she came. And, and how I've witnessed and watched God do a work in her life. And God's just changed her whole, whole idea about who she is and how important she is in the kingdom of God. And you have no idea how important that is to me as the pastor. And she has been an awesome, tremendous blessing to me in watching the transformation that has taken place. So you understand what happened there? God brought her here to, for this church to be a blessing to her and then turn around and made her a blessing to this church. Man. That's the way it's supposed yes. to work. Yes. And I got news for you. Every one of you have that same call on your life. Yes. I pray this church will be a blessing to you. I, I pray this church can encourage you and help you. But guess what? You've got some things God wants to do through you to help us. Yes. And it's time we start stepping into that call. Yes. I want to I wanna read this because I, I want to get this right. Here's, here's the biggest stumbling block for most people as they go through and God begins to build it. Their character doesn't match their calling. Amen. Amen. I got news for you. There was a day and time, and, and, and Bonnie and Nancy tease about this all the time, you know, because Nancy was Bonnie's 
counselor in camp years ago. And I've heard Bonnie multiple times say to Nancy, Nance, all those years ago, did you ever in your wildest dreams? Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank God to be part of the pastoral team, your pastoral team at your church. Hallelujah. Nancy doesn't even have to hesitate. Nancy immediately, nope. 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 Thank you, Lord. Bless your holy name. You understand? Yeah. Why is that? Because at that time, her character right. didn't, match. didn't match her calling. Thankfully, though, God's helped her grow. <laughs> now, did that erase her past? No. Nope. But I think part of that past has helped build her into the person she is. That's where I want to take us back. You know, when we begin to talk about Jacob. Remember we talked last week how Jacob, Jacob had that encounter, you know, going from, he was running away from his brother, he was on his way out, he was running from his past. Because you understand, Jacob was called by God. Anybody want to dispute that with me? From the time he was born. Yes. <coughs> it's biblical. Matter of fact, it's so biblical the Bible says, you know, they were twins. And they were fighting even in the womb who was going to be. And the Bible says Esau came out first and Jacob had a hold of his heel because yeah. he wanted to be first. Mm. But because he wasn't first, but we also understand that mm. what God had already prophesied about, he said, the older will serve the younger. That didn't just apply in that situation. It also applied, you know, when, when Joseph was born. Right. All of his older brothers. But you understand, so Jacob, from the time he was born, he'd been called of God. But I got news for you. He was a liar. He was a thief. He was a finagler. He did everything in the world but the right thing. Did that change the fact that he was called of God? No. Nope. Could God use him in that character? No. God had to change it. God had to let Jacob get to a point in his life where he was willing to change. And I love when we see about, you know, when he encountered God and, and God gave him a vision and then he went out and then he came on his way back and, and on his way back, he was coming back, finally, if you read it, you'll find out he was coming back, finally, to do something. What was he going, coming back to do? He was coming back to face his past. Because he'd already sent word to his brother Esau. And he said, you, 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 he sent the messenger, said, go tell him. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in this place. You tell him to come. It's, it's, it's time, it, it's time we set this straight. And God honored Jacob in that. And that's when God sent the messenger. He sent the angel down. What was Jacob's first response with, to that? <laughs> I hope you get this like I got this. He wrestled with him. That was his character. If I'm going to get anything in life, I'm going to have to take it. One way or another, I'm going to take what I need and what I want. So when God sent the messenger down to bless Jacob, what did he do with him? He's going to wrestle a blessing out of him. But if you read that and you begin to let the beauty of that whole scripture begin to take place, he went from the point where he was wrestling, and somewhere along the line, Jacob's per whole persona changed. His whole, his whole idea about what he was doing Changed, and the Bible says that he that he quit wrestling, and all he did was wrap his arms around that angel, and he says, "I ain't letting go. Hallelujah. I got a hold of you now, and I ain't letting go." He says, "You might as well bless me." He says, "Cause I'm just going to hang on." He wasn't fighting him anymore; he was hanging on for dear life. And I got news for you: there's a few of us maybe need to take a lesson in that. We need to stop trying to fight these battles. We need to stop trying to get where we're going our own way and working it on ourselves. Just get a hold of God and hang on for dear life. Amen. 
And he told him, he said, I ain't letting go till you bless me. So what did he do? The Bible says he blessed him. Amen. <laughs> Bing. He touched him in the hollow of his leg and made him limp for the rest of his life. So, well, that don't sound much like a blessing to me. you got to understand Jacob's character. Right. He had to find a way to remind Jacob every day of his life. He had to find a way to remind him, guess what? I'm dependent on God. I can't do anything in my own strength. I can't even walk straight unless God would help me, unless God would bless me. And, and he walked with that limp the rest of his entire life. That was the way God blessed him. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to teach you to be dependent, 100% wholly committed and dependent on me. Jacob kept trying to deal with his past before he could step into his calling. You know what I'm saying? He wanted to deal with his past and then have a beautiful encounter with Jesus, free and clear. I got news for you. Don't work that way. If you're trying to straighten out your past and deal with your past and fix everything you've done wrong in life and say, as soon as I get that taken, oh man, somebody got to help me now. If you think you're going to straighten out your past and you're going to get all your ducks in a row before you step into what God has called you to do, i got news for you, you will fail miserably every time. You can't fix you and then have an encounter with God. Which brings me right back where I started. Everybody, anybody who walks through that door in this house is welcome. Oh, now, Pastor, you don't know who they are or what they are. Oh, no. yeah. Let me say it this way. Pastor, you don't know their past. <laughs> I got news for you, some of you. You don't know my past. Come on. And some of you found out some of the things there are in my past. You'd look at me and say, how in the world can that man get up on Sunday morning and preach? Right. Same way you would. Because I had an encounter Amen. with Jesus. Amen. And my past, God took it, and now he turned it into something that's very useful to me. Can I, can I talk to some people? Can I minister to some people about certain things? Yes, I can. Why? Because I've been there. And I got news for you. When Jacob got to that place, when Jacob got to that place, you know, guess what happened? Remember, he was going to face Esau. And what happened after he had that encounter and God blessed him? He came face to face with his past. And you know what God did? He rearranged it. So that past he was so afraid of, that past he thought he was going to have to fight his way through. That past he thought was going to haunt him the rest of his life and going to destroy him. The Bible says he had come face to face with his past. And his past, namely his brother Esau, blessed him. Wow. And I got news for you. God can do the same thing for all of us. You can't change your past. Right. My past is my past and I can't change it. But I got news for you. It don't weigh me down anymore. Amen. I, I ain't afraid of my past. I ain't afraid to face my past. Do I talk about it? Do I brag about it? No. Because God's dealt with it. God's changed it for me. And God uses what's in my past now to strengthen me and help me move on. Can I tell you what God has done? He's done the same thing for me that he's done for every other person in the Bible who's had that encounter changed their name. Abram became Abraham. Saul became Paul. Jacob became Israel. And I could keep naming a few. That's what God does. I got news for you. God has done the same thing for me. Because once I was lost and now I'm found. I'm redeemed. Yes. That's my new name. I'm redeemed. And everything in my past has now been changed. 
what a wonderful thing that is. And, and I don't think sometimes, I don't think we understand the gravity of what it means to, to you know, have, have that, change, that name changed. There's a commitment. There's a bond there. There's something to transform. And, and can, I, can I take just, just a couple of minutes just to unpack that real quick for you? you? You understand how important that is and why God always did that? You ever wonder that when you read in the Bible? Wonder why God always did that. Why did God change people's names? Can I tell you this? You know what the Bible says God has in his relationship? Jesus and his relationship with his body, his believers, his church? How does he reference that? Jesus and his bride. Guess what happens to a bride when she's married to a husband? She changes her name. In other words, it shows the world. It shows the world. We belong together now. That's right. Amen. She's changed her name. Amen. She doesn't belong to anybody else. She belongs to me. And I'm not speaking that in, in belonging to me as property. Right. Because when I say she belongs to me, what I mean by that is now she is my responsibility. It's up to me to love her more than life itself. It's up to me to take care of her and make sure every need she ever has in this life is met. That's my responsibility. Why? Because she carries my name. I got news for you. One of the reasons God hates divorce. Because it's the basic foundation of, of, of God's relationship with his church. It's, it's a marriage. It's a, it's a husband and his bride. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't say divorce was unforgivable. Right, that's right. But God hates it. Why? Because, you understand, it's supposed to be symbolic and then you'll read that in the scripture. I didn't have it on your list today, but you'll read that in the scripture because it says, Behold, I'm going to show you a mystery. The mystery was between the husband and the wife, and they say, I don't understand it. But he said, when he speaks about that, you need to understand that is symbolic of Jesus and his church. It goes way beyond just two people living together as long as they can stand one another. You know, and when, when, when divorce takes place and we just split and go our separate ways, God takes that personally. Because it's just the same as, you know, God being divided from his church or being divorced from his church. That's why God hates it. That's why God calls it an abomination when they, when they make a mockery of what a biblical marriage is supposed to be. Because God takes it personally. From the very beginning, from the very foundation of time, God put man and woman together. Yes. And he said they were supposed to be together forever. Why did he do that? Because it was symbolic of Christ and his church. I want them to understand the closest thing we can come to to understand the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church is to understand what the relationship bond is between a husband and a wife. It's supposed to be unbreakable. It's supposed to be a love that goes deeper than anything that we've ever experienced in our entire life. That's what it's supposed to be. Why is it supposed to be that way? It's because that's how Christ feels about the church. And that's the way Christ wants the church to feel about him. How do we make the changes? How do we do what we got to do? we got to change a few things about what we believe in ourselves. We stand all over the building. Whether you believe it or not, whether you really understand it or not, the reason you act a certain way, the reason you do certain things in your life is because you believe certain things about yourself. It's the truth. You are who you are because of what you believe you are. That's, that's what the world's trying to tell people nowadays. You don't need any other higher power. You don't need anything else. Just believe in yourself and, and believe in whatever you want and then act on that. Just be. You understand? I don't want to be what I believe I am. I want to believe what God believes me to be. That's the book I want to write. Could I take the pen and write my own book and live my life according to what I want, what I believe, and how I feel sure I could? But God has a plan, too, for every one of you in this building today. God wrote a book. <coughs> it's the book of your life. Are you obligated to live it? Nope. You can live it your own way if you want. But I have a 
a suggestion for you. You want to live your best life? Live the life that God designed for you. That's right. Believe in yourself the way God believes in you. And when you do, it will just bring you into a beautiful relationship with God. Where does it all start? I believe where it all starts is for you to learn to be thankful. Don't curse God right? because you're bald instead of having a head full of thick hair like me. <laughs> you know, don't curse God because you're a man and you feel like you don't share the same feelings that every other man in the world does. You know, the, the enemy will tell Trish tries to tell you, well, you're 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 different, but that's okay, just be different, act that way. Well, that may be what the world tells you, but I got news for you. That's you know, am I telling you you have to be a certain way and you have to feel a certain thing and you have to no, I'm not telling you. You you could feel what you feel. But do what you do based on what God says. That's right. Amen. Based on what God says. Yes. Because he did create you. Yes. And you can live your best life. Just living the life God meant you to live. Where does it all start? Be thankful. Be thankful for who you are. Be thankful for what God has put in your life. And make sure. Make sure that it's more than lip deep. We evaluate.